Welcome to CXQA Live, where we discuss the role the agent plays in creating successful CX call center operations. Now, we do record this time for the Recorded for Quality Assurance podcast that is made from this time every Tuesday at noon Eastern, and we release that the following Monday. So this week on the show, it's a special week. It's a special day because it is CX Day, part of Customer Service Week, and we have on the show Jim Tencher who is our special guest. Jim's book, Do B2B Better, is launching today. I really recommend the book for anyone who takes CX seriously, especially in B2B or B2B2C context. But Jim, welcome to the show. We're really glad you're here. And congratulations on the release of your book today. Thanks, Rob. It's an exciting day. I've uh, been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, it's finally here. Uh, well, it's CX Day. I look forward to that every year. Uh, but, you know, when your book launches, that that adds a little bit to the special nature of it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I, I think it's kind of a, a privilege for us to have you on the show on this day, just because it's a special day for you professionally. And so we're, we're honestly honored just to have you with us on, on this day. So um, also, uh, we're going to be talking about something that's really important to me. And I think really important to a lot of people in the CX world, and that is activating the passion of agents for CX excellence. And it's something that's challenging to do. It's something that you have to have a very specific mindset and ability to engage with agents and, and, and to really cast a vision for why it matters and how it all works together and, and provides value for the customer and fulfillment for the agent. So that's where we're headed. Um, just as a reminder, here on CXQA Live, we believe that agents are the single most important asset in CX operations. And we believe more specifically that agents with the right training and tools and connection with your company will be a revenue and growth protection center for your business or brand. They're going to be the best diagnostic tool that you have for your business because they're so close to the customer and working through customer issues and, and can actually build co connection and relationship with customers. They're going to ensure that your customers are satisfied and connected to your business. They're going to produce more and better work, and they're going to want to stay and contribute to the long-term success of your company if they have the right training, the right tools, and the right connection with your company. So uh, that's the agent centric call center philosophy. But uh, really excited about having you here with us, Jim. Jim is a, a CX practitioner with over 25 years experience in multiple industries. And he now serves CX organizations through his consultancy firm, Heart of the Customer. So again, welcome to the show, Jim. Well, thanks. Really glad to be here. Awesome, man. So in your book, just to dive right in, um, you lay out in my view, an absolute goldmine of principles and ideas that will make any business better. And, and not just ideas and principles, but some very practical, actionable ways of applying those principles and ideas into a business. You know, how, how to operate within the leadership context, how to uh, actual ch help actual change happen within an organization. That's one of the sub themes of your book. Um, and I, I was really grateful to receive the advanced copy and my physical copy is supposed to arrive today on release day. So I'm crossing my fingers it gets here. Uh, but towards the end of the book in chapter 12, you turn your attention specifically to the frontline employees, right? The, the people that are engaging with the customers on a regular basis and specifically how to activate them in implementing the principles that you've spent 11 chapters leading up to that chapter, kind of detailing and laying out. And you rightly say that if the, the company leadership is not fully bought in to that focus on customer experience, and, and that's a big part of your book, as I said, how to get leadership to understand it, to be behind it, to invest in it. But if they're not, if the leadership of the company doesn't understand it, then it's going to be more damaging than helpful to make changes with the expectations and processes for the frontline agents if the leadership is not bought in. I would love for you to unpack that dynamic for us a little bit. You bet. And it comes back to really what is what are you trying to accomplish in customer experience and service? Our work shows that three out of four are looking at this differently from the one out of four who are the change makers. A change maker sets up an overall system where you understand, I, I call it the CX loyalty flywheel, where you understand how the changes you're making are 
all aligned to create better outcomes for customers, yes, but also for the organization. That the flywheel is designed to create an environment where customers want to spend more with you. They want to stay with you longer. They want to actually to operate in ways that are less expensive to serve. Um, the real difference between a change maker and the hopefuls where the organization may be doing good work, they don't know if they're creating that flywheel or not, is that the hopeful organizations will look at sentiment, look at piecemeal work. The change makers, going down to one word, they study and change behaviors. Hmm. Coming back there, bringing that back to your specific question. When we look at a change maker, they look at creating a system that creates customers, again, who want to reward the company by spending more with them. I mean, the other organizations, they look at customer service as almost the place to go at the end if everything else fails. Uh, instead of a congruent part of the overall experience, it is, I don't want to say dumping ground, but it almost feels that way sometimes that, oh, if we can't fix it, service will take care of it. And that, that puts service obviously in a pretty awkward position. Mm -hmm. And what we find is if the group, if the organization doesn't prove that value, prove that the flywheel exists and prove that the right way involving customers leads to greater outcomes for everybody. Well, then the customer service always becomes the tail of the dog. And as it's whipping around, that customer service is whipping around to, okay, here's the behaviors we're going to focus on this week. Oh, hey, now we're going to look at this. Oh, no, we need to upsell more. Incredibly different, difficult to create a great experience, also incredibly difficult to create a great employee experience mm. because there hasn't been the patience to say, here is how the contact center fits into this overall congruent experience. Instead, we relied upon them to fix it. Now that involves a lot of things involved, not just setting expectations, which where of course it begins, but also we look at informing the agents. If you're looking at agents to fix things at the end, that's one process. But if instead you look at them being a congruent part of the overall experience, well, then they need to understand more of what has happened to the experience so that they can act appropriately and proactively. And so it comes back to really when you're, if you don't engage leadership, you're reactive. Now, a little bit more on that specifically. Great. Simply helping executives, telling executives, hey, we're important, doesn't accomplish a whole lot. In fact, the worst thing possible is passive executive support, ex passive executive support. Because they'll give you the lips, but they won't give you the funds, they won't give you the hands. And when we look at specifically change management, that last section of the book, by the way, never call it change management. We want to say, you know, hey Rob, I need to change you. You know, that's that's not a great message. Nobody never wants that, change right? management, but it's about again looking at the behaviors that create a better outcome. How do we help that happen? If, for example, Going back to my days when I was a customer experience leader at a large health insurance organization in the health savings account, a number of our problems were created by product. And product wasn't bought into improving outcomes at all because they're all about creating new glitzier products competitors didn't have. Whether customers wanted them was a completely separate question that they didn't focus on. So let's say you want to help product understand why they need to care about the service experience. The first step is to actually show how their KPIs get better. How do they get more successful through this? Likely through product adoption, through uh, if your product owns PL, likely through increased retention, but to draw that direct line to them so they can see it. So, number one is to actually show them that by paying attention to you, they're more successful. That's the first step, but that by itself doesn't go very far. The second part is giving them explicit things that they need to do differently. That's the second part. And then third is to keep feeding them that information ongoing to make sure that they stay bought in. Uh, back in my early days, I, I led customer experience, I mentioned for an HSA group, and our product team was convinced. Let me pause for a minute. If you have a health savings account, our research, so most of our employees spend eight to 10 hours a day thinking about HSAs. Mm -hmm. Most of our customers don't spend eight to 10 hours a year thinking about health savings account. They just don't care, which creates this big dichotomy over what customers want. 
And by the way, I was told we don't need to talk to customers. We are customers. Yeah, the most biased customers. If I want to convince them that they're creating too complex of an environment, which is what we were doing, I need to draw a direct connection to what's happening in the contact center and to how it's impacting their success. And that starts with understanding what their success looks like. But that's that's a key part here, getting back to that, is understanding their needs. You can draw that line. If you don't do that, and we've seen what happens when that doesn't happen, is the contact center is playing catch up with the flavor of the day coming from the business. Mm. Yeah, that's really solid. I, I think, you know, we won't call it change management. We'll call it, um, you know, organizational trajectory, right? Activating employees. Right. That's what I like to use. Yeah, and activating that's what employees. About. And, I, and, I, and I like the mentality there. And it's all kind of throughout your book, too. It's kind of inter, intertwined. But in those scenarios where, you know, you get that passive um, support from executive leadership, where they, they, as you said, they give you the lips, but they don't give you the funds or the hands. You know, additionally, when it doesn't work, it's easy to cut the whole effort off at the knees because they say, well, we tried it and it didn't work. Right. Um, but that's not really trying it, right? It's either we're all in and we're all aligned along the same why, or it's not going to work. And, and that was sort of a recipe for disaster from the beginning. So I think, you know, as you described it, it's really a helpful principle for, you know, any organization that's trying to activate new principles or values. And in this case, we're talking, of course, about a focus on the customer experience. Um, now, there's another idea from the 12th chapter that I wanted to highlight, um, and that's the link between customer outcomes and agent outcomes. And I'd love for you to explain how you see those two things as being connected. Well, they're, they're incredibly connected, or at least they should be. And a great example of that. So in the book, I walk through four change makers. Uh, we repeat repeatedly, uh, we, we visit repeatedly throughout the book. I want to use an example from Roxy Strominger. Now, those not familiar with Roxy, she leads customer experience strategy for UKG. They're a SaaS software company. And coming in, they didn't have a clear connection between those outcomes. And so she created a system to understand how to create that linkage. And what she looked at is one of the best predictors. I mean, I should be careful about overstating, um, uh, but she saw a clear linkage between a knowledgeable rep and a better customer experience, which leads to higher retention, higher cross-sell, as well as lower cost to serve. And the linchpin to that equation was a knowledgeable rep. Hmm. Well, we've all been, I, I started my career in customer service and I can certainly remember trying to answer questions that I had no clue. And that's a rough environment for anybody. Right. That's not a surprise. What's different is she was actually able to show almost basically financially the impact of that knowledge in the overall customer experience. And so, we can all imagine what it's like to be that rep who doesn't have the knowledge. It's miserable for the rep. It's bad for the customer. She was able to connect linkage by showing that when we take the time to help develop our reps better, that yes, that takes an investment, but it results in higher score and knowledgeable rep. Okay, that's, that's intuitive, but also then creates an environment where the customer doesn't feel a need to call the next time this issue happens. And so she looks at that behavioral data and they have a call, they call in for an issue. When that issue pops up again, do they call again? Or do they instead use self-service? Uh, by the way, one of the other concepts in the book is this concept of an emotional North Star. There's this confidence. And she's able to create this chain of value that when the rep is knowledgeable, customers report being more confident. When they are more confident, they're more likely to use self-service for future issues, which then leads them to be, their organizations be more likely to renew their contracts and even to purchase more products. This chain of value. When you've taken the time to build that chain of value, well, now you look at the contact center very differently. 
not as a place to fix problems created by your product or bad processes, but instead as a comprehensive part of the experience where you create an environment where customers feeling more confident want to come back to UKG to buy more and they will never think about leaving. That's how you align what's, in, what's important to the agent with what's important to the organization. But it takes the hard work of connecting those linkages. Yeah, no, that's, that's really a different way of putting it than I've heard in other contexts. And it's one of the reasons I wanted you to talk about it. You know, the, the chain of value, right? You know, as a customer, I know if I call into a contact center uh, and, and I feel like I'm not really getting clarity or there's no connection to my issue, right? It's just, well, here's this policy that really doesn't really relate to what's going on, whatever the case may be, that's going to cause an overall disconnect for me as a customer, right? Oh, but, yeah. if, but if you're able to engage and you hear the agent engaging, um, they, they're able to access the right information that's relevant and present it in a clear way, help me resolve the issue. Not only am I just glad to have that checked off my list for the day and, and have that in the past, but as you said, I have more confidence in my relationship with that brand and whatever money I'm spending with that brand does not feel like a waste. Right. It, it feels like something that I'm getting value for, right? And we focus on B2B organizations for the book, but this is not B2B specific at all. And we found the great programs do, they start with that ending, which is we want them to stay with us and buy more. Mm -hmm. okay, that should be our goal all the time in customer experience, customer service, customer mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. Took the step back from there in Roxy's case and says, well, confident customers do that. Frustrated customers don't. And then they looked at the different interactions, different touch points and said, where are we activating confidence? Where are we creating frustration? And applying that specifically to contact center, they looked to say, okay, when we look at when customers are confident, we look when they're frustrated, she actually measures eight emotions. What's different about those interactions? And after listening to calls, after doing analysis, she said con confidence is created based on when the rep is knowledgeable. Not just that, but that's a key one that, so she developed the system to establish the chain so that she wasn't looking at the contact center as a one-off, but instead an integrated part of the overall experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as an agent, you would want to be able to be a positive part of a customer's yes. journey with your brand, right? So I, I don't like going to work um, or logging on to work, which is now a good portion of our economy, right? Uh, with work from home and remote work and feeling like I've not accomplished anything of value or I've not served anybody's needs or I've not improved anybody's day or experience, right? No, nobody wants to feel like you're just making everyone miserable and hurting <laughs> your company and like that. Nobody wants to work in an environment like that, right? So if agents are empowered to provide value to the customer, that's going to have a multiplier of positive customer experiences because that agent then is going to feel the, the confidence in the brand that they're representing. They're going to feel confidence in the role that they play and the way that they're able to serve customers. And that just becomes another type of flywheel, right? Where everything is, is cycling back in a positive way and positively influencing the ultimate business outcomes that executives want to see. But if we leave out that, that dynamic, that connection between the customer outcome and the agent outcome, if those connections aren't being made, if those things aren't being cultivated and, and fed with a holistic view of the customer journey in mind, then oftentimes we're just hammering down on improving performance metrics without exactly. getting to the root of it. So imagine you're the coach trying to help that agent. And if we use a traditional measurement system, which is let's look at average handle time, please don't, but we got to look at it. Um, and then look at customer satisfaction. You look at that and you say, okay, well, you know, uh, Jacob, you are not satisfying your customers. Could you do better? Jacob's like, I'm trying, I'm doing all I can. But if you take the time to build the system, you say, okay, Jacob, your customers don't feel like you're knowledgeable. You may know a whole bunch, Jacob, but you tend to go off and jog everything. Let's coach you on how to bring your knowledge to bear faster and more so that you create more confident customers. 
Well, the coach has a much easier time coaching against confidence and knowledge than satisfaction. Right. And that's where it helps to align everybody's interests because you've built a system instead of a one-off. 100%. 100%. And there's also a cultural aspect of this within a company as well, within CX, right? So, you know, I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups that contact center agents are a part of. And honestly, a lot of the conversations that go on in those Facebook groups are really sad and just negative beyond belief. And, you know, people talking about, you know, um, the way that they're treated by customers, the way that they're treated by, you know, organizations as, you know, contact center agents. And, and I think, you know, it, it does tend to be weighted negatively when you have a public forum for people in a specific job. So you got a grade on a curve, if you will. Right. But at the same time, uh, you know, there are people in these groups from all over the world representing all different types of companies. And there are some key components that seem to be correlative throughout all of these, you know, contexts. And, and, and one of them is that they're oftentimes in a CX environment, unfortunately, is not a culture of we bring value to the world by helping our customers. Right. And that's a pretty meaningful why and, 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 a, and a deep sort of motivation that really can be the seed of a very healthy culture that if it's cultivated from the top down, and really shown to be what we believe in, not just, you know, throwing a pizza party out here or there when everybody gets frustrated, but actually saying, what are the issues? How can we improve? How can we make your agent experience better as an employee? And and seeing the connection between all these things, we can actually start to see people that believe in their work and believe in the value that they provide to other humans who call in or through chat or email or whatever the case may be. And that's where those business outcomes that the executives are really looking to see uh, are going to be affected in a positive way. Oh, yeah. And a lot of that begins. Daniel Kahneman has a saying I love, which is what you see is all there is. If you look at the role of an executive who's making decisions that impact the agent, typically the agents are in a metro area. I'm sorry, the, the executives are in metro areas. For example, with that HSA organization was spaced here in the Twin Cities. The contact center was two and a half hours north. Cheaper space, great uh, talent available at a lower cost. And the executives never made the two and a half hour trip. Mm-hmm. I put together specifically on a Friday in the summer when it's Duluth is a wonderful place to visit. I put together a day we brought the executives to spend a day at the contact center. Most had never been there before. And so they don't think about the contact center because they're out of sight, out of mind. And that's what great leadership does is they bring that to bear. Uh, Hydro-Quebec is a utility, um, water utility, hydro, in Quebec, probably gathered that. And they won the North America Customer Statricity Award specifically about how do we bring customer experience to everybody. They put together a program where they started with the CFO. And they brought the CFO to the contact center to spend a few hours listening on calls. She would start by introducing herself. The agent did all the work. And then she'd come in afterwards and ask, you know, how did that call go for you? But it was a completely new experience for her. They took pictures. They made it a big deal. They made such a big deal. The other executives wanted their turn to come to the contact center. Now, they were nervous. They were actually more nervous than the agents were. And so they had to do a quick training for them about here's what to do. But the way they began their customer experience transformation is by getting executives to understand what it's like in the contact center, because that's where much of your experience happens. Yeah, no, that's, that's really big stuff. And I, I really hope that as our conversation goes on every Tuesday at noon, that we'll continue to have a diversity of different roles within CX organizations that are represented around this figurative table that we're, we're trying to have a dialogue where maybe some pathways for conversation are opened up that maybe have not been before. And, and this is a key theme, right? You know, for executives to really understand that they may not understand. And the only way to, to change that is to go sit in that agent's chair, actually walk around, listen to types of calls, have, engagement with the agent. So how's it really going for you? And to really get to that point where they're 
feeling the pulse of what's going on in their contact center, um, what a difference that would make, right? And, oh, yeah. and the belief in the agent's hearts and minds about what they're doing would be bolstered so, so deeply by that type of activity. And there's some organizations that do this really well. And uh, I'm looking for uh, some change makers, if you will, to talk about some of their experiences as you detail in the book. Well, you know, we're getting close to our half hour time, Jim. Um, you know, I, I have, I want to reserve 30 seconds for uh, a special kind of announcement for everybody who attended today. But uh, I'd love for you to just tell me, because today is CX Day. Tell me from your perspective, what does CX Day mean to you? And how should CX organizations and agents view this day? Well, it's a special day. I've looked forward to all the 10 years it's happened. It's been a big part of what we do. But also, it's a really critical opportunity for you to represent your work to the rest of the organization. Stacey Sherman in the book talks about how she uses it to really introduce what customer experience is and what it means to you throughout the whole organization. Hydro-Quebec did as well. It's an opportunity for you to change the dialogue. You now have an excuse. There is a customer service week, CX day. You have the perfect reason to get in front of the customer experience and bring it to your staff so they understand what customer experience is and what it means to them and what they can do to make it better. It's the perfect opportunity that unfortunately too many people miss, but it needs to be a time. So if you have didn't do anything today, well, you have 52 weeks to get ready for next year and it's right. time to start putting the budget requests and start to make a plan. That's really good stuff. That's really good stuff. Well, I promised a special announcement at the end. So um, Jim has a conference coming up. Yes. Uh, and it starts on the 18th. Is that correct? That's October? right. So one day conference on the 18th here in Minneapolis, okay. where we'll bring in the actual change makers. I speak a little bit, but the rest of the day are the people really doing the work, talking about how they change, how they create change management organization, how they create this system I talked about, the flywheel. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so Jim graciously has offered a discount for any of you that attended our session today. And I'll be emailing you guys the link to make that discount happen for you and, and to research the conference a little bit more. And we appreciate you being here, but we appreciate you offering that discount to our attendees as well. And as a special surprise, I didn't even tell Jacob this. Um, uh, I, I would like to buy a copy of Jim's book for everybody who came today. All right, um, and have that sent out to you. So um, I'll be emailing you guys about those two things. And um, I really think there's a lot of value in your ideas, Jim, and uh, very thankful that we were honored to have you on our show on CX Day, the day that your book launched, and um, really hopeful that we'll continue to collaborate and that all of us will continue to have these conversations to help us grow in our CX journey and to focus continually on the value that the agents can bring to the whole experience for everybody involved. So uh, again, thanks for being here, Jim. Thanks for being here, everybody. I hope you guys have a great Tuesday, a great CX day, and a great customer service week. Excellent. Bye now. Thank you guys. Bye guys.